haven't got the cool light. Totally staged. This is okay. Okay, well, good afternoon. Good afternoon to those of you out in the uh, Kate audience as well. Uh, what we're going to do today is uh, continue to explore the wonders of the neuron. The neuron is the main character uh, in our scenario uh, leading to operations of the brain. Uh, the neuron is basically a cell. It is one of the two types of cells in the brain. Uh, the other type of cell, we're not going to speak of too much, uh, it's the so-called glial cells. Uh, one sort of glial cell that we did not mention already was the type of cell that wraps around the axon of a, a neuron. And as we'll uh, do, we'll take a couple of minutes here and just kind of reiterate uh, where we left off last time. Uh, and our main focus was to look at the uh, structure of a typical neuron. And uh, even though I didn't do this uh, last time, it's easier to show this in two stages. Uh, a neuron has a central terminal, so to speak, or a central cell body. And uh, from the cell body, various arms and legs, so to speak, come out. Uh, the main thing that comes out that carries the signal uh, through the, the axon. Uh, the axon uh, in the types of cells that we're mainly concerned with it is covered by a different type of uh, cell called uh, myelin. That, as you'll see, is roughly akin to the insulation wound around a, a, a wire, although it uh, functions somewhat differently. On the other side of the cell body, the signals are coming in. Uh, they come in on to these branches called dendrites. Uh, the dendrites can either come out of the one corner of the cell uh, the apex of the cell, for example, or they could come out of the uh, side arms, the so-called basal. Uh, that's a small distinction of, of little consequence. The important thing is that onto these dendrites, there are input signals coming from other nerve cells. And they are of two uh, sorts ones that cause more output signal to be produced and those that produce less of an output signal. And the two excitatory and inhibitory inputs play off against each other. You get a lot of excitatory inputs going, then the output signal is maxed out. Uh, if you have only inhibitory signals, the signal comes out is, is basically zero, and in between you've got a, a continuation. Now, the signal that goes out, as well as the signal uh, that, that uh, goes in, is a train of impulses known more formally as action potentials. And it is the frequency of the APs that is increased when the cell is excited and it is the frequency of the H HPs that are the APs that are uh, suppressed or lowered when inhibition takes over. Obviously you cannot have a negative frequency so the most you can do uh, with the inhibitory input is to silence the cell. And the analogy we made is that the excitatory inputs are like the accelerator of your car. Uh, 
and the inhibitory inputs uh, are like the brakes. The analogy has even uh, some more specific pertinence because uh, you can inhibit a lot of excitation with a single input because the input is usually made right onto the cell body where the accounting is taking place. So just as uh, tapping on, on the brakes can, can bring you to a, a halt a lot faster uh, than stepping on the accelerator can accelerate you up to speed, uh, inhibition uh, can be applied uh, uh, pretty uh, abruptly. Uh, the other things that uh, we pointed out, that uh, in addition to the stuff that you find in any cell, such as a nucleus, uh, there are metabolic things called mitochondria and all kinds of things that we'll largely ignore for our purposes. The main component of the uh, whole neuron is the membrane or the neuronal membrane. Every cell if you go back to high school biology, it's surrounded by a plasma membrane. It turns out that the membrane consists largely of a layer of fat called a, a lipid, and we'll look at the uh, details of that uh, down the road a piece. Uh, uh, but suffice to say that it is the membrane which yields the electrical signal. And indeed, uh, it's worth uh, considering how one can go about recording uh, such signals. Um, one uh, way of, of recording a, a neuroelectric signal was uh, the way we uh, mentioned was done some years ago by uh, scientists in England uh, by the name of Hodgkin and Huxley who were fortunate enough to discover that the animal uh, that we know is a squid, uh, not, the, not the superconducting quantum device that you were familiar with, but the actual squid like Captain Nemo encountered with eight tentacles, etc. The squid happens to have some very large axons. Uh, why it has large axons is interesting to ponder, and we'll, we'll look at it later on. The short answer is that the uh, lower animals... I hope I'm not debasing the squid by calling it a lower animal. Animals that are below the vertebrate level uh, do not have this uh, myelination mechanism. And in order for them to produce axons that conduct signals rapidly enough to achieve uh, the job that needs to be done, such as an escape response in a squid, uh, the axon has to get bigger and bigger. Now, as you can imagine, uh, as evolution progressed, uh, we went from a squid, which only has to have one stereotypical escape response. It just whooshes off uh, to animals uh, like us who have to get up and, and run down the street, uh, or as we'll see, hopefully towards the end of this lecture, uh, have to automatically withdraw our hand from a, a hot stove before it burns up, etc. The more complicated these rapid responses are, rapid in the neural context is some fraction of a second. It's not nanoseconds, as you might be used to from a computer standpoint. But even to achieve the fraction of a second responses, uh, you need to have some uh, axons that are either large in diameter, as in the squid, or uh, are coated with this uh, myelin. And we'll, uh, we'll see why that's the case. Um, how do you record uh, the signals? Uh, one way is to insert an electrode right into the axon. And maybe in the next slide that's, that's easier to see. Uh, in the case of the squid, the axon is about 100 times wider than it is in uh, a human or any uh, sort of a, a vertebrate. So whereas an axon... Uh, of a cell that controls escape responses in, in our bodies is something on the order of 10 microns diameter. In a squid, uh, the diameter could be up to 
a millimeter or a thousand microns. Since we keep, we will be always talking about dimensions in the, in the realm of, of uh, microns, which is one micrometer. That's a thousandth of a millimeter, uh, even though it just refers to these, these, uh, microns. So it is possible with such an axon uh, to do the kinds of things you would do in a, uh, in a circuits lab. Uh, let's see. possible to actually stick a wire inside the axon. You can take a strip of, of this axon that's several centimeters long and actually put a thin wire down the middle. Anything on the order of a fraction of a millimeter would suffice. And then you could put a wire on the outside. As it turns out, it doesn't have to be right on the outside. It has to be somewhere in the fluid surrounding the axon. Suffice to say that uh, nerve cells, including their axons, only operate when they're in the proper liquid milieu. And we'll see what, what that is, but for the time being, we'll assume that the uh, axon is kept in the animal's own blood or something close to it. And then it's possible, as our friends uh, Hodgkin Huxley did in the late 30s, to simply look at the difference of the potential between the inside and the outside. The voltage that you get when you do this is referred to as a transmembrane potential. That's probably not very visible. Let me go to a better... Uh... And it is typically denoted by capital G sub M. The voltage across a membrane. Now, why do we say it's a transmembrane potential uh, when it's simply any time, any place inside the cell versus any place outside the cell? Well, it turns out if you move the wire from the middle of the axon to the membrane, or if you move the outside wire from right over the membrane to millimeters away, it doesn't matter. The key thing is that the two wires have to span the membrane. And that is why the membrane is thought of as, as having this uh, source of, of potential that we'll explore. And indeed, the membrane has the characteristics of an electrical battery plus resistor plus capacitor. But suffice to say that uh, no matter where you put the electrode inside or outside a, a cell, uh, you get the same signal because it's generated right at the membrane. Now, with that in mind, uh, let's go back to uh, a cell such as this. Now, it's not possible to put wires into uh, cells that are, first of all, buried in the middle of, of brain tissue or spinal cord, and secondly, are, are fairly small. Uh, even a large spinal motor neuron which is among the largest nerve cells in our body, might be a maximum of about 50 microns across at its widest part, which is the cell body. But what you can do, uh, and that was done starting in the uh, early 50s, is take a glass needle, a, a, uh, a tube made out of a pipette, about a one millimeter pipette, like you might have used in freshman chemistry to, to uh, pick up small amounts of material, and make the tip of that uh, pipette very, very sharp. And it's possible using a particular device to have a tip diameter down on the order of a tenth of a micron or so. Uh, and yet, the pipette is still patent. It's still a continuous hollow tube. That 
tube can be filled with a physiologically correct solution that also is a good electrical conductor. Typically, it's filled with potassium chloride, KCl. And uh, the initials KCL might bring to mind Kirchhoff's current law, uh, for those of you who can think back to circuits one or so, or physics, or whatever uh, venue you encountered it. Uh, but the here, and as it is in chemistry, it stands for potassium chloride. So the, the ionic constituency of our blood, and that of a squid of, of most animals, is uh, largely made up of a solution of potassium and chloride, smaller amounts of sodium and other ions, as we'll discuss. The point being that you can't stick a wire into a cell. First of all, it's hard to do that physically. Uh, and secondly, a metal wire put into a cell will kill the cell. The cell does not like uh, having foreign objects stuck into it at all, but it will tolerate it if the foreign object is sharp enough and what's inside of it is not terribly different than what's in the inside of the cell, which is largely uh, potassium chloride. So the point is that you can actually get this uh, pipette down to the point at which it can be plunked into a cell without actually ripping the cell apart. The cell has a, uh, a membrane which, which allows for puncturing and resealing. It's a little bit like a, a self-sealing tire. Now if you come back and you put the wire that we were talking about not into the cell itself, but into the barrel of the pipette, and that wire can be several, meter, several centimeters away from the actual tip, uh, and then that wire could be put into one side of an amplifier, uh, which is uh, grounded on the other side by having a wire simply sitting outside of the cell. So you have the same configuration that you do with the squid axon, but the wire is connected to the inside of the cell through this uh, small electrode, and this is called a uh, intracellular electrode. And the voltage that you get uh, is called an intracellular uh, recording. And uh, what it records is the transmembrane signal once again. Once again, if you were to poke the tip of this electrode around the inside of the cell, uh, it doesn't matter how deep it is, as long as it's right under the membrane and the other electrodes is outside the membrane. So it is a, it is a transmembrane potential. This uh, advance in the technology, uh, which was developed by two guys by the name of Ling and Gerard in the, in the 1950s, uh, along with the uh, special amplifiers that are needed because these electrodes, as you can imagine, being uh, non-metallic and having very small tips, the electrodes have a, an output resistance uh, in, in the order of uh, 10 to 100 mega ohms. So you need to develop a, a, an amplifier that has an extremely high input resistance and it wasn't until contemporary op amps came along that it was possible to, uh, to record with this uh, technique. So the concomitance of this uh, kind of clever way of, of sticking an electrode into a cell along with the electronics available to record the output uh, allowed for recording the uh, signal from any nerve cell uh, anywhere or, or practically any nerve cell anywhere. You can put these electrodes uh, into... Uh, squid axons if you want, or you can put them into uh, nerve cells sitting in a dish that have been teased out or cultured, or you can put an electrode like this down into the middle of the brain or 
various uh, axons, etc. And uh, eavesdrop, uh, if you will, on the signal that is going into and coming out of a cell. And indeed, if you put the electrode here in the cell body, you have the advantage of being able to tune in on the potentials that are generated on the input end, as well as the signals uh, uh, that, that come out uh, through the axon. And we'll uh, show uh, examples of, of both of these. So that is the uh, sort of uh, technology that has allowed uh, neuroscientists to learn so much about signal processing in the brain and the rest of the nervous system. Now, let me go back to the slide sequence. Uh, we pointed out that the uh, at the other end of the cell, after you reach the end of the axon, then the process is repeated. Uh, the axon will branch out and make contact with the uh, with the uh, next neuron and will either cause that neuron to be excited, fire more action potentials, or to be inhibited as the, uh, as the case may be. Uh, this, again, is the historic tracing uh, of the action potential in a squid axon. Uh, 1939 was the year it was done. Uh, the fellows who did this, uh, Hodgkin and Huxley, turned out to be pretty good engineers as well as uh, neurobiologists in those days. And in fact, uh, soon after this was published, they were scooped up by the Royal Air Force and spent the next six years working on the evolution of radar. They, along with obviously hundreds of other British scientists uh, developed the radar systems that saved the British Empire, uh, as, as they said. If it lasted a thousand years, uh, that was their finest hour, if you recall, and it was used to detect uh, uh, planes coming in from Germany uh, before they could actually uh, be seen in the R. The, R the RAF, the Royal Air Force, was able to send up... Uh, fighter planes to shoot down these planes before they could bomb London. Uh, a few still got through, obviously, um, but uh, it was quite an invention. And it was because of the uh, electronic trickery that Hodgkin and Huxley had uh, that they were able to do this as well as uh, have a key role in the development of radar. Question? Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering, what is that periodic signal on the bottom of that? Oh, the, the periodic signal on the bottom... I believe is a, uh, a sine wave, and if I'm not mistaken, you can check it on the book. I think it's a 600 hertz sine wave, which gave a, a time calibration. So indeed, uh, uh, each cycle was 0.1 seconds. Now, does that seem right? No, it doesn't. Uh, that's 0.01 seconds, right? One, 600 hertz. No, I'm sorry. Each cycle would be 1 600th, or would be about 1.5 milliseconds. Did I get it right this time? Anyway, uh, skipping all the details, this is a way that you can calibrate the time, so you have a, a signal uh, in both uh, time and uh, voltage. This is the uh, transmembrane potential. What is interesting is that even when the cell is not doing anything, the, the potential across the membrane is not zero. It's something on the order of about uh, minus 50 to minus 60 millivolts. And that's called the resting potential. And it is sometimes denoted as V sub zero. Don't worry about all these nomenclatures. We'll be using them over and over again. They'll eventually sink in. But the point being that uh, when something comes along to perturb the animal or 
in the case of the experiment where the axon is taken out of the animal in the dish, uh, something is, is done to tweak the uh, axon to produce an impulse, such as a small electric shock delivered at this point, uh, the response is one of these uh, pulses. And the pulse, it consists of two phases. There's a positive going phase. which might bring the signal from about minus 60 to about plus 40 millivolts, as you can see, so that the initial phase here is about a tenth of a volt, or about 100 millivolts. So it's a good-sized signal uh, if you have the proper way of measuring it. It's not down in the microvolts or millivolts. Uh, it's well above any, any uh, uh, noise issues, even with the technology in those days. And then there's a, a negative after potential. This phase here. And that lasts uh, about uh, another uh, two milliseconds or so. So the whole cycle might last about uh, two and a half milliseconds. And if you come along uh, after about uh, two or three milliseconds with another electric shock, another impulse, then the whole process uh, can be repeated. And as you might uh, surmise from this, the repetition rate uh, can be as high as, as uh, a couple of hundred pulses per second. So that is the range in which uh, this axon operates, and it's pretty typical of most axons. You don't get firing rates in the order of uh, millions of pulses a second the way you would in a computer, or these days perhaps even uh, gigahertz operations. Uh, so you're, you're down in the sub- kilohertz operation. And then right off the bat, you say, well, how could the brain work with a signal repetition rate that is so, so slow at its most basic level? And the answer to that in brief is that it's a massively parallel computer. It does not require the rapidity of a bit serial machine. Now, I barely know what I'm talking about when I say that, uh, so don't push that uh, analogy on me, but... Uh, the operation of our brains is, is very uh, unimpressive if you think about it being consistent of, of elements that have uh, bandwidths in the order of 100 hertz or repetition rates uh, of, of uh, bits in the order of 100 hertz. But a lot of things are happening at the same time, as, as, as we'll see. So that is the basic uh, nature of, of the impulse. It could be measured in a squid axon with wires, or it can be measured these days by putting in uh, these uh, micro pipettes, these intracellular uh, microelectrodes. And indeed, as the technology has uh, evolved, uh, it's been possible to, sm to study smaller and smaller elements uh, with greater and greater precision. Uh, now getting back on the uh, anatomical track for a minute, uh, uh, the uh, anatomical uh, variety of, of nerve cells is quite rich. Uh, most of the nerve cells can be clearly identified as having the axon, uh, the dendrites that receive inputs, uh, the cell body, uh, uh, and uh, some of them have the type of dendrites that can be separated into the basal and, and apical, uh, but some of them become even more complex. This is a so-called uh, Purkinje cell of the cerebellum, a part of the brain that uh, does a lot of uh, small transactions, uh, controls sort of the uh, micro motions of individual uh, muscle groups. Uh, it needs to get a lot of inputs in uh, 
and therefore the dendrites uh, are, are quite uh, manifest, and, and the branching is, is uh, kind of like the hair of a, of a medusa, just by comparison to the uh, more typical uh, motor neuron that you have in, in, a, uh, uh, in, a, in a cell body. This is the kind of cell that conducts a signal from uh, our fingers, as we'll see in a few minutes, uh, into the spinal cord, much simpler than what's uh, in the cerebellum. Uh, some cells only have a single uh, axon and a single dendrite, uh, and others even have a uh, so-called unipolar organization, which the cell body seems to sit off on one side, and the dendrite and the axon are actually doing double duty. It's more efficient in a way, but it doesn't operate as well because the dendrite and the axon have to uh, alternate in their uh, and their functionality, the same process brings signals in and then uh, outputs signals, and that further limits its its uh, bandwidth. Uh, these cells, in fact, are only found in, in invertebrates, like the aforementioned squid or uh, lobsters, shellfish, uh, etc. Uh, you sometimes have cells that have uh, just one axis and the cell body sits off to one side and this is kind of like the sensory cells uh, in, uh, in humans uh, as we'll see. The cell body uh, sits off to uh, one side of the uh, spinal cord uh, while the uh, electrical axis from the input end uh, through the dendrites to the axon uh, kind of goes past the cell body. The cell body obviously is there to, to keep the cell alive. Any uh, of these cells uh, can be studied uh, by putting electrodes into the uh, cell body depending on the uh, size of the cell and its anatomical accessibility. Uh, you, you might be able to put electrodes not on the cell body but out in the dendrites or out on the axon. And that's the presumption we're going to make in our uh, little uh, trip through a piece of the uh, nervous system in a, in a minute or two. Uh, okay. There are different types of, of behaviors that we can uh, talk about as, as employing the the sort of neural signals that we're, that we're involved with. Uh, for example, if you go to a doctor's office uh, and uh, you're having some question about uh, pains in your legs or numbness or you're being drafted into the army, uh, they will, uh, among other things, uh, do a knee-jerk reflex test. In which the muscle below the knee is, is uh, jostled by the hammer and inside of the muscle, this quadriceps muscle in particular, uh, there are what are called muscle spindles. These are actually uh, devices in the muscle that sense the stretch and relay it back to the nervous system. So when you stretch a muscle as with this hammer, you automatically get a signal uh, that will extend the muscle to compensate for that. And that is the so-called knee jerk, the kicking out. And this operates, uh, we won't go into detail because we'll show, a, I think, a more cogent example, by sending a, a signal from the muscle spindle through a sensory neuron, which is represented here with the cell body sticking off to the side, and that acts on uh, which is myelinated, uh, goes into the spinal cord uh, down in the lower part of the back and causes a signal to flow out these synaptic endings into the dendrites of a motor neuron. And this motor neuron will then feed a signal back and cause the muscle to contract. Now, you say, well, why 
why do you go through all that trouble when you could just have a wiring from the muscle spindle to cause the muscle to contract directly? Well, this turns out to be a rather, a rather sophisticated servo loop mechanism that is not there for the purposes of, of testing your reflexes, but is there to continually make adjustments to uh, allow muscles to carry the load. Now, when you're uh, even picking up an object, uh, you can't just say, well, I can estimate the, the size of the object and I'll contract my muscle uh, to pick up a, a, a one-ounce object. Uh, what happens is you start to lift. There's a signal that tells you how much muscle contraction there is, and then that tension is adjusted. And indeed, if somebody comes along and, and adds a pound to the one ounce load, your hand doesn't just drop down. Uh, what it does is it adjusts to that new load rather automatically and, and maintains a, a fixed control. And indeed, the, the purpose of this is, is a fixed position servo loop. Contrary, uh, contrary, by contrast, when you want to move your arm, if you issue a command to move your hand from here to here, or if I want to pick up the pen and move it from here uh, to the screen, and then I want to do some writing, I am issuing commands in the form of spatial commands. I'm, I am telling my hand, go from here to here, which means telling my muscles to contract to make that motion. But I don't communicate with the muscles directly. I send that signal down to the spinal cord, which sets up a, a, spine, which sets up a, a servo loop, which repositions the hand and uh, sets the position regardless of the, uh, of the amount of force up to a certain point, uh, as is commanded uh, by, by the motor system of the brain. Uh, so that if I pick up a pen that, that weighs three times as much, I will still be able to issue the same position commands. And that's what the, the muscle, muscle system is all about. Uh, we could talk about the, the uh, signals that are, that are generated all around this loop, but rather than doing that, let me just show you a brief summary of this. Uh, let's, let's get back to that later. By taking out the muscle spindle, uh, hypothetically, it could be done physically to some extent, but uh, you wouldn't actually remove the system from the body. But you could isolate the muscle uh, spindle, and you could put an electrode into the muscle spindle. And when the stretch was applied by the hammer, pushing on the muscle, one would see a potential generated at that point, a transmembrane potential whose time course and voltage magnitude was proportional to the amount of stretch. In other words, there's a kind of an analog signal, which is a direct transposition, if you will, or a transcription of the time course and magnitude of the stretch. The longer the stretch lasts, the longer this signal across the muscle spindle ending, nerve ending lasts, the more intense the stimulus is, as you can see here, and the bigger is this shift in the membrane potential. If you move your electrode down the line a bit to the uh, axon which goes from the muscle spindle towards the nerve, one could still see these graded potentials, these analog signals, which then are called also receptor potentials. 
that get smaller and smaller as you move down the line. Uh, they're uh, attenuated. And indeed, if you go a couple of millimeters away and put the microelectrode in, uh, you won't see any of the receptor potentials. What you see instead, though, is an action potential, this nerve impulse, which is about a tenth of a, a volt high, which first seems to be superimposed on the receptor potential, but as the receptor potential disappears, that action potential remains. So the information is conveyed from this point all the way up to the spinal cord, which could be a distance of a meter or so, by virtue of this action potential. In reality, as we'll uh, look at uh, in more detail, you would get a chain of these action potentials whose frequency and duration mirror the magnitude and duration of the signal. Magnitude is transformed into pulse frequency. Duration is kept as duration of the train of, of, of pulses. So you basically have a pulse frequency modulation of the signal, uh, which is first a mechanical signal and then is a analog voltage signal. When that signal arrives at the spinal cord, it makes, it communicates with a motor neuron, as we pointed out, a, a, a cell which then goes on to cause the muscle to contract, i.e. The, the knee jerk. And again, uh, there is a graded potential. In this case, it's due to the release of a, a chemical, as we'll discuss, onto the uh, motor neuron uh, cell body, or more likely to the dendrites, this is a little bit misleading, this picture. Uh, it would, the connection would be made right on to a, a dendrite. Depending on how many potentials fall onto this motor neuron, how many of these impulses are coming down the axon, and how many axons are carrying the signal, uh, there is a, another potential, another analog signal Uh, that is generated, which this time is proportional in magnitude to the frequency of the train that is impinging. So this is a demodulation from a pulse frequency code back to a voltage magnitude, or it's going from a digital to an analog signal. So you start off with an analog signal that's mechanical to an analog signal which is electrical, that is transposed into a digital signal in the form of these pulses. And the purpose of the digital signal is to get the information over long distances. Uh, and then there are also noise issues, as you can imagine. Uh, these pulses do not change over distances because they're, they're regenerated. But even if they did, as long as they're big enough to discern their time signature, uh, that's all you need. Even if the individual pulses get distorted, they get smaller, they get longer or shorter, as long as you retain the, the time sequence, you can reconstruct the analog signal at the other end uh, through this uh, demodulation process. Into pulse frequency. Then the process is repeated again. All of the signals coming into this motor neuron are added up, including ones that could be inhibitory. And we'll see why they want to be inhibitory. For example, if you wanted to restrain the knee-jerk reflex, you might send signals from the brain into the motor neuron and say, ignore the signals coming from the sensory neuron, apply the brakes, and actually reduce the, the, uh, the knee jerk. Uh, you can't do it well enough to fool the uh, army physicians into thinking that you're uh, not eligible for the draft when 
when that was an issue back in my younger days. Forgot that there is no draft anymore, but there's still physicals that are given. And then once you're back into the form of an impulse, again, the analog signals that are generated in the dendrites go bye-bye after a, a short distance. And the signal that goes back to the muscle is in the form of a train of these action potentials. And the process is repeated again when you get to the muscle because the muscle is an electrical uh, system unto itself. The reason the muscle contracts is that it is driven electrically to fire its own impulses. There are muscle action potentials, and it's the muscle action potentials which then cause the, the muscle to contract. So you start with a mechanical signal, you go to an electrical analog signal, to a digital signal, back to an analog signal, back to a digital, uh, then back to an analog, back to a digital, and then finally back to a contraction. Uh, a lot of conversion, but the, uh, the name of the game is that uh, the actual computations, if we're looking at where is the signal processing taking place in terms of, of deciding what's going to happen down the, the road, it's where the analog signal is. But in order to get the information that is, that is shaped at these spots down the road or down the axon, uh, it has to be put into the form of, of this uh, train of, of uh, digital impulses or, or train of, of action potentials. Action potentials. Okay. Uh, let's look at this same thing uh, in a different uh, format. And I will turn your attention to the handouts, uh, which contain uh, that figure on, on the bottom. And uh, you can follow the drawings I'm making by, by sort of filling in the, the, uh, uh, the blank spaces. And let's see if this is going to work. First of all. Oops. Yeah, I want to go back. Wait a minute. I'm, I'm just wanting to go back now. Okay. Let me see if I can get myself a piece of graph paper here. I want to get that. I want to get that graph paper, or even get back to that figure that we showed you earlier. Okay, I can't get back the uh, little straw man that I already drew. Right? It's easier just to redraw it, I guess. Okay, allow me a couple of minutes to kind of catch up with you guys. Here is the guy uh, we drew. Somewhat distorted personality. And... Uh, Let's think about what's going on in his nervous system. Uh, let's say this fellow is uh, unlucky enough to touch a hot stove. Uh, what sort of things are, are, are going to happen? Uh, well, I won't have room. Well, we'll, we'll uh, make a kind of a, a side list here. Sequence. 
you want to do is get your finger off the hot stove as fast as you can before it starts to burn. And Mother Nature over the millennia has developed a nice way of doing this by initiating a withdrawal reflex. So even before you are aware that you touch the stove, this process of getting your finger or hand the hell out of there is initiated. And in fact, uh, if you time this very carefully, again, you, you can get into the brain. What's the color now? I want the color to be black. Let's, let's kind of superimpose the, the brain here, brain stem. And here's the spinal cord. Now, up in the uh, brain, there's a uh, an area that we call the uh, sensory cortex. Remember those strips on the side of the brain where a signal has to come in order for you to be consciously aware of its existence. And indeed, uh, that takes a bit longer than the beginning of the withdrawal. Your intuition might be, well, I'm touching a hot stove. I feel the pain. And I say, ouch, that hurts. Let's get the heck, let's get the finger the hell out of there. And you volitionally decide to do that. Well, uh, the problem with this is, as you can see from the anatomy, is that uh, that would take a fairly long time. First of all, the signal would have to get all the way from the uh, finger somehow to the sensory cortex, which means it has to go into the spinal cord, get all the way up there, and then some processing has to take place where the signal is recognized. Uh, and that might take several tenths of a second, during which time... Uh, your finger is starting to smolder. Now, even longer might be the um, reaction to the pain, such as, ouch, that hurts. Or who the hell left that stove on? Or something even more colorful. And that sort of mentation uh, takes even longer. But still, within a fraction of a second, uh, you're, you're aware of what's going on. You've kind of figured out what, what has happened. Uh, and, and you make the appropriate uh, verbal reaction. Now, if this is the first time this is happening to you, such as if you were a, uh, an infant, uh, you may not know what's going on. All you do is feel the pain, and there, a, there is a memory trace recorded, which... tells you not to do the same stupid thing again. So uh, if, if you uh, knew what was going on, you certainly would not put your hand back there. If you didn't know what's going on, you might very well, after having the hand slightly burned, uh, put the hand back there. But after uh, even an, a, a, uh, an infant does it a, a couple of times, they stop doing it because they remember uh, what's going on. Uh, there are some other things you could do uh, as an alternative. This is part of this uh, higher uh, function or, or lower function, depending on your viewpoint. Supposing you were uh, doing this, uh, touching the hot stove uh, as part of a bar bet. Uh, and uh, you say, well, I can, I can keep my hand on the stove longer than you can. 
so I want to overcome that uh, reflex. And indeed you can. But it turns out in order to do that, you have to pre-inhibit the reflex. You cannot stop the reflex once it gets started. But if you know you're going to touch a hot stove and you want to keep your finger there, you certainly could. Particularly if, if, if it's not super hot, if you're, if you're picking up something that you know is hot, uh, uh, you suppress the, the reflex to drop that object and, uh, and, and you withstand whatever pain is going on. So, uh, how does this actually work in terms of some uh, neural uh, wiring? This is our first uh, example of some uh, real mental uh, behavioral scenario. And uh, we'll look at the sort of wiring of, of what's going on. Uh, let's start down here at the tip of the finger, uh, or the fingers. Uh, there are receptors that sense heat. Those cause a signal somewhat like the stretch receptor. And after some short distance, the signal is converted to a train of impulses, which will draw out. And that train of impulses is carried by a sensory nerve all the way up your arm, across the shoulder, and into the spinal cord. In the spinal cord, it makes connections with another neuron which actually goes out the other side of the spinal cord. Uh, for those of you who are anatomically particular, the sensory signal goes in the back of the spinal cord. The motor signal comes out on that same level and goes over, follows the same major nerve tract. This would be the, uh, is that the brachial nerve, I think? It doesn't really matter. Uh, but it's in the same bundle. And it goes to make contact uh, with a muscle. So you have the same reflex kind of thing. First thing that happens is a train of impulses goes up into the spinal cord within a small fraction of a second, about a tenth of a second, in fact. Signals are coming back to the muscle. The muscle contracts, uh, and the um, uh, hand uh, is withdrawn. Now, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, we'll get into the complications maybe next time that in order for a motion to be produced, you have to contract a, a muscle to lift the hand and also inhibit the contraction of the contralateral uh, muscle. Uh, if you contract all the muscles in your arm, your arm will just freeze. So when you're contracting your arm, as you might be doing when you're lifting up your finger, or this will make that the presumption, you're contracting your biceps, just as you're doing when you're showing it off to people you want to impress. Now, when you make that contraction, you have to also inhibit the triceps. Conversely, when you bring your arm back down, you want to contract the triceps and inhibit the biceps. So all muscle motions are made up of reciprocal pairs, and therefore there is a neural pairing of signals that go to those muscles. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to how that uh, operates. Uh, if you were to stimulate both sets of muscles, the arm would, would freeze. And that can be demonstrated simply by getting an electric shock. Using an electric shock can do a lot of damage, even if it doesn't burn you, is that by stimulating both sets of muscles abnormally at the same time, uh, you can actually tear up tendons and all that that, are, that aren't meant to, to operate that way. But at the very least, an electric shock 
causes you to go into what's called a state of uh, titanic contraction. You can't move, uh, but your muscles are sort of uh, frozen rigidly. Um, now, uh, at that same juncture where the sensory and motor nerves come together, uh, there is also an output that will go, as you can imagine, up to the brain. And that is what winds up in the sensory cortex. It's not a single axon. There's some relay stations, and we can explore that a bit later. So while the signal is sort of racing around this uh, so-called reflex, this is referred to as a reflex arc, not anatomically an arc, but it sort of forms a, uh, this uh, return path. Uh, the signal is also going up to the sensory cortex. And uh, by the same token, or complementary token, signals that uh, respond, such as a signal uh, to lift your finger out of there, before you touch the hot stove, let's say you see the hot stove, you can actually send a signal from the motor area of the brain, and it goes out. And in, in that case, it goes out the same signal as, as the uh, motor nerve to the muscle. So basically, you've got this kind of uh, uh, parallel system, a reflex arc that is, that is rapid, it's autonomic, and indeed, it can operate even if the spinal cord is damaged. So, uh, particularly in animals that can recover from uh, a, a completely severed spinal cord, the, there are still reflexes uh, that can operate. One of the things that is uh, being done now in sort of rehab engineering, uh, neurobioengineering, whatever you want to call it, is to try to keep the reflexes alive in patients that have suffered spinal injuries and may even be uh, quadriplegic because of that. Because if you can take a signal from the brain, have it control a computer, which then signal, sends a signal back down to the juncture of the spinal cord with the output signals, you can essentially electronically bypass uh, the, the break in the spinal cord, and that's because this level of operation is still intact and you can uh, take some advantage of it. Obviously, you're never going to restore the complexities of, of normal motion, but it's, it's uh, better than, than complete loss of control of the peripheral part of the body, arms, legs, etc. Uh, clearly, it's, uh, all of these things I say are more practical to do with the lower limbs if the lesion in the spinal cord is between the arms and the, the legs, and the arms uh, can still operate. Okay, let's spend a couple of minutes uh, summarizing this by playing a little game here. I, I turn your attention to what you've got on the sheet in front of you. Uh, let's identify a number of places where we can record a signal. Let's start uh, at uh, position number one. which is at the initial receptor level, right where that hot stove is hitting. And uh, each of these boxes uh, might be something like 10 milliseconds. This is time. And this is the dimension of voltage, particularly the transmembrane voltage. And we'll assume that we can stick a microelectrode, one of these intracellular electrodes, that we talked about any old place we wish. Uh, whether that's practical or not, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll not deliberate. It's, it's certainly possible to do it here and here. Uh, the degree to which you can do it in various parts in, inside the brain and spinal cord is limited. So the, the resting potential of the receptor is not zero. Uh, 
but might be something like minus 70 millivolts. When the uh, uh, hot signal is first applied, nothing happens for a couple of milliseconds because it takes time for this to heat up. But after uh, perhaps uh, uh, five milliseconds or so, a signal starts to get produced in the form of a shift away from minus 70 towards zero. This is called a, a, a depolarization. I won't, I won't make this too much. I'll mention this and we'll get back to the nomenclature last time. But it's a positive going signal. It's an analog signal. The hotter the surface is, the bigger the depolarization is, the longer you keep your finger on it, the longer this depolarization is. So it's just like the stretch signal we talked about. It's an analog signal. Like the analog signal, it produces a action potential, a nerve impulse, which might bring the potential all the way to about plus 40 or thereabouts. It's the aforementioned 100 millivolt signal whose uh, duration is about a millisecond. We won't even show the, uh, the details. We'll just show it as a vertical line, but it looks like the squid axon signal that we uh, looked at uh, in detail. And indeed, if you keep the heat on the finger for a while, or even if you withdraw the finger and it stays hot, a train of these impulses is generated. The intensity of the signal is encoded by the frequency of the spikes. So you have that pulse frequency modulation again. And uh, if you move your electrode uh, down to uh, a point on the other end of the sensory neuron, near where it goes into the spinal cord, we can see what it is that the spinal cord is seeing from this signal. Make this uh, position two. Same resting potential, more or less. There is going to be a delay on the order of about 10 milliseconds for the impulse to go roughly a meter. The conduction velocity of the signal is on the order of 100 meters per second. That's the fastest a signal can get transmitted. Not very impressive uh, compared to a, a fiber optic or uh, even a, a plain old copper wire which transmits uh, uh, hundreds of millions of kilometers uh, or meters per second, i.e. almost the speed of light, but it does the job. And the job it does is to convey that same train of impulses as was generated back at the other end. So if, despite my lack of artistry, each of these four impulses show up delayed by roughly uh, 10 milliseconds from where they started. Now this is happening not just in one axon, but it's happening in perhaps a dozen axons in parallel. And again, the amount of input that goes into the spinal cord is measured uh, in, in two senses. One is the peak frequency of firing of the impulses, the faster the firing rate, the more information, the more uh, the signal is interpreted at the spinal cord as ouch, you know, uh, it's an intense signal. Also, if you have more of these signals in parallel, you get more of an input. These sum up through these uh, dendrites uh, that we had referred to and we can go back to, and if we look at what is happening in the third position, which is the signal coming out from the spinal cord along the motor neuron, and I forgot to label it as such. This is called the sensory neuron. 
the output is called the motor neuron. Actually, not it should be motor because it's it's causing motion, but it's actually spelled motor neuron. So again, if we look at the motor neuron, uh, not here. I'm sorry. Let's see if this erasure will. Whoops! Ah, I erased the whole damn thing. Damn. Can I restore that, or did I lose the whole? I want to, to restore that figure. You can try Control Z. Oh, there we go. Good. <laughs> I won't try that again. <clears throat> uh, suffice to say, I'll just cross that out. This, this, the motor neuron is here. These two signals are coming from the two ends of the sensory neuron. The, the distal end where it's touched, and this is the end where the uh, sensory nerve goes into the uh, spinal cord. Now, coming out of the other side is the motor signal. And we're first going to put the electrode right into the cell body of the motor neuron where all of the dendrites converge. And what we see, lo and behold, is after a short delay due to this uh, synaptic transmission process, uh, which takes a couple of milliseconds, every time there's an impulse, what shows up is a small positive going signal in the cell body, which is an excitatory signal. And indeed, because the signal lasts a lot longer than the action potential, if you get a sequence of action potentials producing a sequence of these longer-lasting signals, the longer-lasting signals add up in time to create a signal, and we call this a depolarization. which means a positive going signal, which is much like the receptor potential is. So again, it's like an analog signal whose magnitude is proportional to the frequency of the incoming spikes and also to the number of, of inputs that are coming in. And this will... this. Uh, burst of these signals that add up in an analog domain, once again, not surprisingly, will give rise to an output of action potentials. Those action potentials, if you monitor them down at the muscle end of the motor neuron will show up without the underlying analog signal, but will show up faithfully as the sequence of digital-like pulses, action potentials that were produced here with about a, another 10 or 20 millisecond uh, delay. Same process being played out again. Local signal processing in the analog domain, the output signals then transmitted as a digital sequence. And to, and to get to the end of the lecture fairly quickly here, if you look at what's happening in the muscle cell, there are two processes that are rather similar to what's gone on before. After some delay, the muscle cells will produce their own action potentials in the same time sequence as the motor neuron produces them. That, in turn, will cause, and I'll just superimpose it on here, even though that's a different dimension. Each time you get an, an action potential, you get a small muscle contraction which lasts for 
several hundred milliseconds. And the result is that you get a summation of these signals, which is the contraction. So the muscle has the same duality, digital action potentials translated into analog contraction signals. And the overall strength of the contraction of the muscle depends on how rapidly the ash potentials take place and also how many nerves are, are firing. So the final analog, digital to analog translation takes place by also translating from electrical uh, back to the force of contraction. So uh, we'll, uh, let, let me uh, tune out, let's get off the air, and then, then I'll entertain your question offline, unless you think it's important to the whole. Okay, uh, so here is an example, uh, and it seems redundant, and indeed we'll see this over and over again, of how the nervous system handles information. And believe it or not, this one little reflex is emblematic of, of how all sorts of uh, uh, nervous system signal processing takes place, including, including the more mental aspects. And we'll pick up and talk about what happens when you want to stop the signal and when you want to uh, win bar bets by pre-inhibiting the signal and all that kind of stuff. Next time. If you have any questions, come on up and we'll, we'll uh, entertain them. So I want to get off the 